Hyrod. Definitely not Purple. <laughs> <laughs> Hyrod Energy Group, where she conceived, launched, and directed research services for traders, investors, and governments to track political and commercial risks and assess impacts on oil, gas, renewables, power, and emissions markets. She was also an adjunct professor at New York University. Sitting to her left is Dylan Reed, head of Congressional Affairs with Advanced Energy Economy. Dylan directs AEE's Congressional Affairs initiatives in Congress. Prior to this current role, he also managed all political and regulatory initiatives for numerous states including Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Prior to joining AEE, Dillon coordinated programs for the Institute on Comparative Political Systems at the Fund for American Studies. Sitting down at the, at the very end is, uh, is Devin Hartman, elect Electricity Policy Manager and Senior Fellow with the R Street Institute. Devin researches and promotes competitive electricity markets efficient energy in innovation and environmental policies, and sensible electric rate designs. Before R Street, Devin conducted economic analyses of wholesale electricity markets at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. His areas of focus included renewables integration, environmental regulation, coordination of natural gas and electric industries, and using markets to procure resources to meet reliability. Devin also worked at the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, where he spearheaded the initiative to modernize Indiana's electric resource planning rules. He led research on risk and uncertainty management, as well as advanced technologies, including electric vehicles, carbon capture storage, energy storage, and distributed generation. Uh, Frank Kaliva, sitting right here to my left, is the senior spokesman with the American Coalition of Competitive Energy Suppliers, Access. Access is a coalition, is an association of competitive electricity and natural gas suppliers committed to helping consumers better understand and take advantage of the benefits of clean energy choice and competition. Frank is also president of the PR Quinlan, of PR Quinlan, where he helps energy companies understand and respond successfully to public policy opportunities and challenges. Frank and his team have over three decades of experience in retail electricity and clean energy markets. Previously, Frank managed the public affairs practice at Strategic Communications, where he provided consultation and government relations assistance to clients in multiple sectors, including energy. Um, I'll next open up for, for each of our panelists to talk a little bit about themselves, but before doing that, I'll, I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Charles Hernick, the Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum. Uh, we are an organization that's, that's relatively young in this space, uh, but very much focused on free market competition uh, with an eye towards, and, and an all of the above, uh, energy sources with an eye towards moving the needle towards clean energy. Um, so, Frank, if you want to talk to us a little bit about your organization, Access, introduce the organization and, and what your role is in, in Energy Choice. Sure, be happy to. Thanks, Charles. And my thanks to, to both Crest Forum and uh, R Street for inviting me to participate again on this, this terrific panel. So, Access is a group of competitive electricity and natural gas suppliers. And for, as Charles mentioned, you know, depending on where you live here in the DC metro area, you may be more or less familiar with some of those names. So if you live in Maryland or DC, where uh, two uh, jurisdictions where there's a pretty competitive electricity and gas market for folks who want to buy their energy supply from someone else other than the utility, um, that's something you may be more familiar with. If you live in Virginia, like I do, um, where you don't have those same choices, you may be less familiar with <laughs> electricity and gas suppliers, though there is some gas choice available in Virginia. But on the electricity side, you, you know the names uh, of the people who provide it for you. So my companies um, in our group operate in the, the restructured electricity and gas markets around the country. Um, there's debate about how many there are. When we look at it from the residential consumer perspective, which my group really focuses on, somewhere between 16 and 20 states have some form of choice available to residential electricity and gas consumers. Um, in some places, it, it may just be a, a two-week period a year in one particular utility territory where you can make an election. In other places, states like, say, Pennsylvania, where you can hop onto um, a state government website called paPowerSwitch.com, and you can scroll through 
literally dozens of offers at any time and quickly um, make decisions about how to switch between electricity providers. So it kind of runs the gamut um, in terms of what's available. What we do is, I think a little bit unique, both on the panel and in this space, is that we really focus on helping residential consumers and small commercial customers understand what choice is, why it's available, where it's available, and then how to exercise that choice. While my members are all companies that have an interest in selling energy to consumers, one of the kind of hallmarks of our group is that we don't do any sales and marketing. What we try to do is explain to consumers, this is what choice is, this is how it works. And whether you choose to stay with the, the energy, the default energy provider, typically the utility, or decide to dip a toe in the marketplace, we want you to understand what those options are and to take advantage of them. So we don't engage in advocacy. We're not, as an organization, we're not trying to change, change you know, specific policies. We want to help consumers understand what those policies are. So our interest really is to help consumers take advantage of choice where it exists, to understand what goes into making a choice, and really to find what the value of choice is. And I think we'll get into that a little bit more, explaining like what, what the value proposition of choice is. And that's something we can certainly talk a little bit more about. Thanks, Frank. Michelle, I think everyone's familiar with Microsoft <laughs> as a company, so you probably don't need to introduce what Microsoft does. But why is Microsoft interested in, in energy choice? Well, thank you, Charles, and thank you to R Street and to Kres for, for organizing and for all the work you do to educate folks on these important issues. So I'm sure that most of you do not think of Microsoft when you think about energy, but it is increasingly important to our business. We consume a lot of energy, and we are consuming growing amounts of energy to power the data centers that make modern computing work. Just to give you a sense of scale, how many folks in the room think that Microsoft consumes as much energy as a small town? You can raise your hand if you think so. Okay. How many of you think Microsoft com consumes as much energy as a city? How many of you consume, think that Microsoft consumes as much energy as a small state? Well, you're right. We do. We consume as much energy right now as a small state, and we're continuing to grow. And so this is a cost issue for us, and it's also an opportunity and responsibility that we see to deploy more clean energy. So we have set ambitious targets to do so, to get 50% of our energy by the end of next year from renewable energy, 60% by early 2020s, and to keep going from there. But we're also a, a company, and we need to make sure that we're doing this in a cost-effective way. We have a, a very tough CFO, and we always have to make sure that it, it pencils out. So we're engaged across the country where we buy energy, and those are states as diverse as Virginia, Iowa, Wyoming, Illinois, Texas, Washington State, some of those states are uh, restructured states and some of those states are vertically integrated states. And in all of those states, we're looking to have more control, more flexibility, uh, and access to market-based pricing uh, so that we can do this in, in a cost-effective way. Uh, and also so that we can do this in a way that's not just about Microsoft buying energy, but about the local community so that we're able to strengthen the grid, so that we're able to make sure that all of the other ratepayers are also taken care of. And we have two recent examples of that where we're very excited. One is in Wyoming and, and the other is in Washington State, and, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, in a little bit more, but we're really focused on having that access to, to flexibility, to, to choice, and, and to market-based pricing. And we work with a whole group of stakeholders to do that in all the states where we operate. We work with utilities, we work with state uh, legislators, we work with regulators, and we're actively uh, engaged and look forward to, to the conversation. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Dylan, could you introduce AEE and uh, what, you're all, what your role is in, in competitive energy or how you view the issue? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think I've talked to a number of folks in the room here, but I can give the, the elevator pitch on AEE. So I think we are a bit unique when it comes to the energy space uh, and that we're a national uh, business association for energy companies, but we really represent a wide tent of technologies. So rather than just one, we think it's up over 50 uh, technologies. So that's natural gas, nuclear, renewables, uh, energy efficiency, demand response, energy storage, smart grid, combined heat and power, fuel cells, you name it, it probably falls within a company that, uh, that is in our, our association. Um, and when you look at it from that kind of holistic perspective, uh, it, re it comes down to this is a $200 billion market that supports over 3 million jobs in the American economy today. So I think a lot of times I hear a narrative, particularly uh, in these hallways, that this is some nascent industry, but it really isn't. This is providing millions of jobs and hundreds of billions of dollars. 
of money into the economy every year. Um, so we take a, a little bit different perspective then when it comes to that and, and how that affects our view on competitive markets and, and consumer preferences and choice. Um, so I'll break that out into, into those two aspects. So one from a market principles standpoint, um, I think the way we, we look at competitive markets and how markets should be structured is really around uh, an outcome-based preference and one that is technology neutral. So really, we want to have goal-oriented markets, right? Ones that we have affordable and reliable power, rather than ones that say we need to have this technology operating because we want, we believe it provides this amount of value. I, I think there we can have various discussions around that, but rather than having characteristic-oriented rules, you should have outcome-based rules. And that really comes down to technology neutrality and allowing all technologies to compete based on the value that they put into the grid. And what we found a lot of conversations with both consumer facing as well as the developers that are selling this in is that oftentimes the rules are written around specific technologies, recognizing what maybe you know 25 years ago when we were setting up these markets, the technologies that were predominant forces there. And now what we're trying to say is there are so many more uh, technologies being in the market that they need to some, somewhat be updated because of that. Um, and at the end of the day, when you look at that from a grid perspective, that's not only going to help with reliability and resilience of the grid, but also be pro-consumer at the end of the day. And I think we'll probably dive into this a little bit later. And uh, it's funny too, when we did this two months ago, it was a day before the, the DOE grid rule was, was announced, so we're in a little bit different world now. But that one seems to be written specifically around resources rather than trying to get to a, uh, uh, an outcome-based model. Um, and then secondly on choice, I, I think what, what we're seeing is there's really a market trend where consumer preferences are playing a much larger role in the way that technologies are getting into the grid and the way that consumers are saying they want more technologies, Microsoft being a, a great example of that. And you can see that on the residential side where you all as consumers may want rooftop solar or you may be looking to buy an electric vehicle or you may have a Nest thermostat. Those are all advanced energy technologies that are now playing in the market that 10, 15, 20 years ago were not. But then even more so, Microsoft being a great example of this, uh, they're a member if you can't tell. Uh, there's the Fortune 100 and 500 companies are really driving a huge charge in, in advanced energy investment and deployment. 71% of Fortune 100 companies and 43% of Fortune 500 companies have either renewable energy or sustainability targets. And what that is ultimately leading to is just massive amounts of renewable energy coming onto the grid because of that. And that's not any mandate oriented or a government policy. That is individual businesses saying, we want this and going to the market to get that. And I think, as <coughs> Michelle was saying, they care about price, they care about reliability. I think it's something like for every minute a data center is down, it's like, $5,000. They're never down. Well, <laughs> if they should ever be down for some other company, it's expensive. So they care about this. Um, and you're now seeing this where, where we have an advanced energy buyers group with a variety of different uh, consumer facing companies uh, that are weighing in on things like the solar trade case uh, and the DOE uh, grid rule, among other things. So this is, this. they're not, uh, I think the, the energy, uh, the businesses that are weighing in on energy voices are, is different than it was five, ten years ago. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dylan, for that overview, and I think a, an introduction into one of the issues that, that we'll touch on is, is how our policies can be shaped and, and oriented towards outcomes instead of uh, you know, picking winners and losers in, in particular technologies. Um, Devin, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing our street, uh, beyond just uh, being a good organizer of, a, of an event like this and, and making sure that everyone is well fed, what else does our street do and, and what's your link into the, the clean energy choice conversation? Sure, so our street is a five-year-old, roughly five-year-old think tank, uh, beyond Bill's colorful introduction of what we do. Um, we're, we're pragmatic free market think tanks, so a lot of times we will like to dig into the weeds and look for free, mar uh, free market victories at the margin. and. So we're, we're multi-issue. We cover everything from criminal justice reform to insurance policy to climate and energy work. Um, in particular, our energy portfolio uh, that we've ramped up over the last two to three years um, has been focused largely on just one principle, and that's promoting competition and consumer choice. Um, in short, we always hear this political line of, hey, companies and technologies should compete on their merits. But what does that actually mean? What policies get you there? How do you do that at the federal level? And how do you do that at the state level? We know that when those conditions are met, 
the best interests of society are achieved. So what we've done is, is look at this both at the federal and the state level. And the best way to do it in the electric industry is to restructure the market. We saw interest in this you know, peak in the 90s and early 2000s. Certain states that have already been discussed here started to, imp started to implement it at that point in time. Um, some were way more successful than others. Uh, I think the, the best example out there was Texas. Uh, but realize that a lot of the transition policies to facilitate competition and choice took a decade. So even though a lot of state legislatures were voting on this 20 years ago, it took in many cases 10 plus years to get all the transitions to go through. And so a lot of the lessons from the 2000s are kind of hit or miss because there was more of a hybrid regulated and competitive system then. Um, what we've seen now this decade is that the competitive model has strongly outperformed uh, both at the wholesale level and at the retail level. So the wholesale level, right, um, which is all in FERC's domain except for, for Texas, um, is just facilitating competition between primarily power plants uh, to, to maintain supply-demand balance at the, the high voltage system. And then what we're going to get more into today is talking about retail choice. And that's where consumers have the option to choose their electricity supplier. And these electricity suppliers buy their product on the wholesale market and then turn around and resell it uh, to end-use consumers. And they can do it under a whole variety of conditions that are tailored to consumer interests. Uh, of course, going back to the prior model, what was wrong with the monopoly regulation is that it was a one-size-fits-all approach where consumers were just, the, the, the central planner just determined what consumers wanted, said, here you go, take it, pay your bill, be done with it. Uh, there weren't any uh, incentives for cost control. There weren't incentives to drive innovation. Uh, in fact, there's perverse incentives for those things. And so these things have accumulated over time, and that's why we've seen a big interest, especially this decade, in a lot of more uh, sophisticated consumers now demanding choice and now recognizing the power of markets. And so bringing all that out within this idea of competition and consumer choice is our primary focus. Thanks, Devin. I, I appreciate that. I think that's a good uh, transition into my, my first question for, for you, Frank. Uh, but just as a reminder to those of you participating out there, feel free to jot down a question. I'll open this up uh, for, for questions from the audience in just a little bit. And for folks participating online, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out and try to ping us with your questions, too. But Frank, um, all right, choice, choice sounds good. Uh, what's the value proposition? to actually being able to choose. I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about electricity. Um, you know, and, and when I'm doing my, my Cyber Monday shopping, I'm, I'm looking for deals, but sometimes I'm looking for something beyond that. What does that mean? What's the value proposition in the energy sector from a retail choice standpoint? Yeah, I think that's the critical question, Charles. And I, I, you know, I think back to, I'm just old enough to remember in the 90s before telecom deregulation, just old enough. Some of you probably don't remember this, but I remember in high school, I met a, a girl at summer camp, as you know, some of you may have had that experience of meeting someone you like at summer camp. Um, I, I lived in Syracuse, New York. She lived in Washington State. And so I spent the summer, uh, after the summer, uh, calling her up and racking up my parents' long distance bill, which was something you used to have to worry about. So I learned very quickly, um, before telecom deregulation, that there, there was a real cost to uh, being able to choose who I want to talk to on the phone. Um, that would not be a problem today. We don't really worry these days about your, your long distance telephone bill. Um, and I think that's really interesting because what you saw in the telecom space was kind of a confluence of technology, so the development of, of mobile phone technology, but also policy change, which opened up, which quote unquote deregulated or restructured the telecom space to allow for competition in an area that had previously been a monopoly and that really didn't have a lot of choice or innovation. If you think about where energy is today in a lot of places, it's not that different than where telecom used to be, which is that you have a, a plain vanilla electricity product that's provided by a, a monopoly. Um, and there's really not an opportunity for consumers to make a decision that might better meet their needs and preferences. You might think that consumers are really driven by cost. And to a certain extent, you know, there is that, you know, you're looking for deals, you want to find a good price. Um, our group did a study, it's actually available on our website, competitiveenergy.org, but I'm happy to send hard copies to anyone who wants one. Um, we did a study comparing Ohio, which is a more or less restructured market, allows competition in Florida, which really doesn't, doesn't for electricity. 
And what we found there was that there was actually a, a stunning similarity between both states in that there was a desire, a strong desire, over 80% for competition in the energy space. But there was also almost an equal number of people were as interested in other factors other than price as were interested in price. And what are some of those other factors? There are people who are interested in a fixed rate product. So something that's not necessarily driven by what the, the current market price is. There's people who want to lock into that, you know, one year, two year, three year, even five year contract for gas and electricity that gives them the certainty that their price isn't going to rise. They're, you know, risk averse. You know, other people are more interested in being able to get cost savings. Other people are interested in what the bundling opportunities are. I'd love to have a Nest thermostat that comes with my energy service. But there's a ton of interest, and I think probably the factor that drives um, non-price based interest the most is, is the interest in, in clean energy. And whether that's rooftop solar or being able to purchase energy that has renewable energy characteristics to it, um, there's a strong interest. And even I think a willingness to pay a premium, though I think as we'll hear increasingly you don't have to pay a premium for <laughs> clean energy, which is the really exciting thing. So we're starting to see kind of you know, interests and costs um, kind of um, connect together. But what we found is that consumers really want to have the opportunity to make a decision that meets their needs and preferences. And to the extent that we can kind of get out of their way and, and to allow the competition that's flourished in other markets to be available to them, you know, I think we're going to see, you know, no one could have predicted this in 1998, right? I mean, you know, maybe a few people at a Palm Pilot or something thought this was going to happen, but most people couldn't have predicted that. Most people couldn't have predicted what the, the additional value that was going to come from that would be. And while, you know, we may never have the energy version of this, there's definitely opportunities for there to be more innovation and more um, choice available to consumers. Gotcha. Thanks, Frank. And I'm, and I'm glad that you brought up the example of you know, rooftop solar. I think that's something <coughs> tangible, you know, for us to, to think about. You know how you get your bill, and you know that you've got a cable that runs to the runs into the street. Uh, but you know, rooftop solar is a tangible example of, of something that you know we wanted to, to get a little independent and, and put that on. Uh, that's something manageable. Um, Michelle, that's a little bit harder to imagine for Microsoft. What does what a, a choice uh, look like for Microsoft? I don't know if you could share an example with us of, of you know, if it was a new data center or something where you, were, you had a couple of options on the table and, and uh, what does Microsoft do when, when faced with those choices or how do you create choices? Sure, so as I mentioned earlier, data centers require a lot of electricity, but they also run 24 seven. So once you have a data center up and running, it's usually a steady load, so you don't have the same kind of up and downs that you might w with other consumers. So for us, we need reliable, we need clean, we need cost effective. We found that competitive markets have helped serve us quite well in terms of price, reliability, um, and innovation. So we're looking for innovative solutions that allow us that flexibility. And I want to go through two recent examples, which are quite different. One is involving our data center in Wyoming, which is has one type of resource you know, base. And then another involves Washington State and our campus in Washington State, which has a different type of, of regulatory structure and resource um, base. So, so in Wyoming, we were looking to, to power our data center. We were going to significantly increase the energy load in, in the city and outside the city of, of Cheyenne. And so we wanted to, to figure out how we could do this in, in a clean way. We wanted to bring online uh, about 250 megawatts of, of new wind power. But you also needed some kind of, of uh, the, the, the utility we were working with wanted to, to build some kind of uh, peaker plant so that when the wind didn't blow, it would be available. They wanted to do it with a, a, a dirtier fuel that we, weren't, um, we, we didn't want to do. They also wanted to rate base the other customers so that their, their price would go up. And so we got together with all of the folks and said, well, how can we work through this? How can we address everyone's needs so that we get the energy that we want, we're getting the pricing structure that we want, you get the reliability you want, and we also make sure that there's no impact on the local ratepayers. So we worked with, with, with our, our, our utility, who was a tremendous partner on it. When you build a data center, you are building a megawatt of battery and a megawatt of backup generation for every megawatt you pull from the grid. So if that something does happen, we have uh, the resilience built into our own infrastructure. So we thought, you know, we never really use these backup generators. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could actually put that to work for the city? And so instead of having the utility build a new peaker plan, which was going to cost the, the, the ratepayers money, why don't we actually try and, and when they have high peak demand, we can run our generator 
and they can use our energy and then everyone's happy and it doesn't cost anyone more. In fact, the price might actually go down and we get the wind projects that, that we want and at, at the, the market rate that we're looking for. So this, uh, this was a deal that was announced at the end of, uh, of, of last year and it really shows you a win-win uh, situation and working through those tough issues to get the, the, the more flexibility and more choice. A separate issue involved uh, Washington State. We have a large campus. That's where our headquarters are. Some might consider it a city. It has 125 <laughs> buildings. So it is, it is a significant uh, amount uh, of energy load. And you know, we've set, as I mentioned earlier, these, these robust uh, targets for us to get more and more renewable energy. And we wanted to do that quicker than the utility was able to do that for us. So we worked out uh, a new contract with our utility, Puget Sound Energy. And we got that approved by the Washington State utility commission earlier this summer and what that enabled us to do is to actually go directly to the open market decide exactly where we're going to get energy from what energy we're going to get and what price we're going to pay and in order to get that contract we had to demonstrate that that was in the public interest so we are paying uh, a transition fee of 24 million dollars to our utility that will be refunded back to the local ratepayers. Uh, we have committed to get hundred percent carbon free energy for our utility, so not just a voluntary statement, we are contractually obligated to purchase that, including uh, renewable energy, solar and wind, which is at three times what the state requires. So the utility currently has to do about 15% by 2020, we have to do 40%. So we are contractually obligated to do that as well. We also thought it was really important that we continue to, to, to support the, the local community. So we are continuing to pay into all of the local services and the programs that the utility provides. And in fact, we uh, increased by 150% what we're paying for the, um, the, the low income and the disadvantaged communities that in the utility the utility program and so we, and and what's interesting about this particular case is that when we announced this we did this in a joint press release with our utility to show that basically we were working in a collaborative way to address everyone's needs we wanted to go faster we wanted to be able to do this directly and we're able to to address the local community needs the environmental community needs as well as the the um what was seen as the economic needs thanks michelle i think those are those are two good stories and I think really drive home the message about uh, about energy choice, uh, specifically meeting your needs for, for reliability and, and price. And I think those are good uh, take home messages for us. Uh, I look around the room here and, and I do see a lot of young faces. And, and I think that one thing that we do want to talk about, and, and Dylan, this cues up for a question for you, is very specifically a focus on clean energy. Uh, and you look at the polling done by any organization. Uh, my organization recently did a poll and it's 75% of young people want to see clean energy, clean energy policies, uh, greenhouse gas reduction policies, whatever that is. Um, but let's just talk about competitive energy markets. What does that mean for cost effective, low carbon intensity technologies? Yeah, I mean, first off, that's a great point that I think you're seeing polling, not just nationally, but in, in district after district and state after state that, that People want this, businesses want this, um, and it's, it's not something that you have to pay a premium for anymore. Um, and I think this has been teed up well that the consumer interest is really there. The question that we often look at is whether or not that consumer preference can actually be met. Can businesses actually provide that? Are markets actually allowing for that technology to get to grid? And I think one great example that we use, we use a lot, and folks may have heard of it, but in uh, Indianapolis, the utility there was trying to, uh, or successfully connected a battery into the grid there. It was providing the service from frequency regulation, which basically uh, is when you plug your phone and you don't want it to blow up, right? You need to make sure the voltage stays at the right level. That's what that was essentially providing. The problem there is that the way that the rules were set up 10 years ago or so, they were basically written to only value a flywheel battery technology. So if it was spinning a flywheel, they knew how to compensate that. They didn't know how to do that for a lithium ion battery. So we tried to go through a stakeholder process, was supposed to be done you know, nine years ago. All of a sudden the battery's connected and they're not getting paid for what they're providing. Mm -hmm. So you know, we went through a remedy process and it's, and it's moving forward, but the problem there is that what market signal does that send to every other battery company in the US that's saying, we want to put this into market, they're not going to do it. What incentive is there if they're going to have to take nine years, 
go through a go through a lawsuit, everything of that. Yeah. And I think you know this idea that you know storage is somehow far off. If we could get storage right, I think the question we should be asking is, are the market signals right? Are the incentives right? Where innovative technologies can provide that in? So at the end of the day, you're provi you're meeting that consumer preference of affordable, reliable energy that at the end of the day also happens to be clean. So, so, and that's just one example, <laughs> but there, there are a lot of issues, and I'll, I'll point to a lot of folks on ENC who are wrestling with these, these issues right now and taking a very forward-looking view on that, and we really appreciate all the great work you guys are doing on committee on that. Um, but really, we need to be recognized that and making sure that, that rules are moving forward in that way. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah. Well, Devin, I think that cues up the next natural question, which is, all right, it seems like there are a couple of good examples where consumers are getting what they want, whether they be big, whether they be small, these choices are, are good and, and it's good, good for environment, good for the, the wallet book, uh, you know, for, for your pocketbook. Um, what does the landscape look like? What are the policy, what are the policy levers, what are the options that we even have to expand a choice? Sure, so sort of the, the policy landscape right now, um, the, the states are in the driver's seat. So retail choice policy, or even the very structure of the industry, is, is dictated by the state. Now, what the, the federal government does, what FERC can do, is make sure that uh, competitive wholesale markets are truly functioning in the most competitive manner. Uh, you know, Dylan mentioned some, some rules, some quirky rules. Well, because there are some challenges to maintaining system reliability um, and some other attributes of the system, there are a variety of rules um, that exist to facilitate competition at the wholesale level. Now, a lot of those weren't designed in mind to, to uh, facilitate some unconventional technologies, and so what we've seen is a, a series of reforms going through to help uh, facilitate that and tear down these artificial barriers to entry. And uh, where we've been successful with that, um, we've sent the right signals to innovate uh, for, for new unconventional technologies. Um, and, and really where the policy landscape is at, is that it's going to be both a federal effort and, a, and uh, state efforts have to be coordinated, especially once we start talking about uh, integrating distributed resources more efficiently. And right now, the, the, the policy landscape from a choice perspective is a bit mixed. I would say tilted towards choice overall. Um, but we actually have a mixture of things. So on one hand, we've talked about all the forces kind of feeding into choice right now. We have technology change. Uh, you know, digital technologies now are empowering consumers. Consumers want choice um, in a whole variety of goods and services in the economy that they were a bit more passive on before. But now they're getting engaged through these platforms. Um, and so that greatly enhances the value of choice. Uh, we're seeing consumer preferences change, right? We're seeing all these sort of manifest, um, both in terms of what big companies, um, leaders like Microsoft, <coughs> other tech companies, and even some of the large industrials um, are, are back uh, clamoring for choice in a lot of states. But we're also seeing uh, some other organizations representing smaller uh, business um, and residential consumer interests recognizing more value of choice. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, calls for reforms in certain states, and that tends to take one of two forms. Um, one is what we kind of call like a, a, a diet introduction uh, to choice, um, which is more of what uh, Michelle was referring to, where Washington State, which is still a uh, monopoly regulated state, um, you know, a lot of folks were recognizing they could get power cheaper with better options on the open market. And so some of the big consumers that are able and sophisticated enough to go to the PUC um, can, can start to, uh, to work out uh, third-party power purchase agreements. And that can either be done through just straight the PUC process at the state level if, if it's uh, legal um, or legislatively. Um, we'll see some opportunities uh, to, to open up some of those opportunities for, for typically large consumers. Um, as I mentioned, that's not going to facilitate a very robust market overall, but it is an introduction uh, to meeting choice needs for some of the consumers. And then we see some other states that are taking a more holistic approach and recognizing, hey, if you really want to facilitate robust uh, consumer choice options, you have to you know, restructure the whole thing. Um, and we've seen a push towards starting to do that well in, in Nevada with the referendum there towards retail choice. And they're recognizing that restructuring wholesale markets is necessary to unleash the full value of retail choice. You're seeing a, um, uh, a, a, a constitutional amendment proposed in Florida right now. And then we're seeing, um, uh, in addition to seeing a lot of interest in PPAs from states everywhere, from Missouri to Virginia to uh, really a whole bunch of states in the Midwest, 
Um, we're also recognizing that we see the, the political calculus shifting a lot. Um, states like Illinois and Ohio, the only two that restructured in the Midwest, um, had the highest rates in the 90s, and now they have the lowest rates in the Midwest. And so some of the consumer groups are sitting there scratching their heads being like, whoa, we've yeah. got to mount a, a, a transition here. But at the same time, um, we have to recognize that choice is under attack in a couple areas. And the primary reason for that is any time a competitive marketplace um, facilitates new entry of, of competitive technologies, there will be some losers, right? The folks that are sitting on those legacy resources, uh, someone's not going to be well positioned for those disruptive changes. And right now those interests have become very strong and have, have run a lot of uh, campaigns uh, to, to undermine choice, whether it's adding surcharges on consumer bills, a state like Ohio has, has had uh, nominally has had a, a, a competitive footprint for a while, but they have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars per year going through um, on, on mandatory charges that really undermines the value of retail choice. And then in a place like New York, where they don't understand Frank's argument very well, of saying <laughs> if, if a competitive supplier cannot provide a service below a certain level, then, anything, then any, any price point above that, they must be trying to manipulate the market or take advantage of consumers. That's not the case because of the product differentiation characteristics, right? It's the same reason that you're willing to pay more for a new smartphone than you are just to keep paying for your existing smartphone, right? The product's better. So we see characteristics in a mixed bag, I think overall, uh, tilted more towards choice. Gotcha. Frank, would you agree with that in terms of the, the overall trajectory that you're seeing in, in the 50 states? And it, and it sounds like this is a, a 50 state uh, issue. Yeah, I, no, I, I think that was, very well said. I mean, you know, in some of the markets like New York, where there has been choice really since the mid '90s, um, there has been this kind of pushback and this this idea that um, all that matters is price, and is really sort of almost, you know, I'll editorialize a little bit. There's a little bit of a paternalism there that the idea that a consumer who should be able to make choice in every other aspect of their life somehow there's something fundamentally different about their utility bill to the point that um, unless a company can actually sell below cost, so effectively, you know, lose money to sell a product that they shouldn't be allowed to sell that product. So we're seeing, you know, that kind of issue crop up in New York. But I don't, you know, want to be too negative because there's, you know, places like Texas on the electricity side and Pennsylvania, um, you know, we're seeing robust electricity shopping where consumers are becoming more sophisticated and are really finding the opportunities to, to, to choose products. And then we're seeing states like Nevada, like California, which has really kind of come out of, you know, they're doing it a little bit differently there than they are in other places, as California tends to do. <laughs> uh, uh, but but they're but California is exploring alternative approaches to um, to this. So I think that there there's in a Oregon. lot in Oregon, absolutely yeah. Oregon. Um, you know, there's there's talk about forming a you know a wholesale market out west. And um, we have direct access. So. Mm -hmm. um, so there's good opportunities, places, um, you know, but still need to kind of make sure that we don't lose ground in the Northeast where it's kind of been the traditional stronghold for choice. We want to make sure that we, you know, keep those markets strong and performing well for consumers, but there's definitely opportunities in other markets now. Gotcha. Um, Michelle, you, you mentioned how Microsoft had works very closely with, uh, with communities when, when uh, facing some of these development, you know, you know developing particular projects and, and whatnot. Uh, but when looking at kind of, you know, re-engineering the energy landscape, uh, does Microsoft work with, with other, other big companies, uh, maybe not your closest competitors, but uh, are there other folks that you're, you're working with and kind of wrestling with the same choice issues with? Well, I, we're a number of uh, associations, and I point to this new AE Buyers Group, uh, <laughs> where you have a lot of different <laughs> corporates. You, all, you know, there's, there's, in the past few years, you've had um, a number of associations and umbrella groups that have come together for different reasons the, of, of corporate energy consumers. Part of it is to just lessons learned and how do you actually go about purchasing energy, particularly for the smaller companies that are starting to do that and looking to get uh, have, have more control over their choice if it's what energy they're purchasing or the price that they're purchasing. And then obviously as, as, as advocacy, um, you've been coming together more and getting that, that voice out there, I think most recently has been with the, the, the FERC notice of proposed rulemaking and then the solar tariffs and some of the other issues. 
Gotcha. Well, let's let's talk about that specifically. The the FERC uh, NOPA on, on grid resiliency. That's that's a lot focused on on two particular technologies, uh, coal and nuclear. But it's looking at providing price support. What does that mean for energy competition? The way that we've been talking about it so far. You want me to sure, start? Sure, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, you know, Microsoft has invested heavily in the future of the U.S. grid. We're a large energy purchaser, and we purchase a lot in FERC jurisdictional markets. We um, also we are also an innovator. We have been developing a lot of different types of technologies to use in our data centers. If it's energy storage, if it is uh, fast, quick start natural gas generators, if it is fuel cells, we now have a fuel cell. Uh, building uh, a data center that we just inaugurated in Seattle. You are taking natural gas and putting it right into uh, a building, and it cuts down on the, um, on the, the, the infrastructure by 50%, and it doubles the efficiency. So it really reduces the, the, the footprint as well. And so we're very active in this space. And, and we think competitive markets have, by and large, served as well, as I said, uh, both on price, on reliability, and on innovation. And, and we are concerned that some of the, the positions that are put forward in, in the FERC NOPER would distort energy markets in a way that would increase cost, first and foremost, for customers, that would um, um, reduce competition, would stifle innovation, and the kind of innovation that you know would help us create the, the reliability, the reliable, and, and, and future grid that we need. Yeah, I'll take a little bit bigger of a swing at that. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I think the way we view it, this is there is something in that rule for everyone to hate. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you are a fan of protecting consumers, this would drive up at the very least, I think modeling is putting this at $11 billion a year. Um, this is a, right now, as you said, we're voting on a tax bill. The House has already moved forward on one. We're very interested in, in taxes right now. This effectively is a tax on every consumer and business in, in, in wholesale markets. Uh, and it needs to be looked at as such. Uh, if, you're in, in, if you're interested in federalism and states' rights, this is the federal government choosing which assets get to be removed from the government and protected from competitive forces. If you're in a state that said, we want to introduce choice, that is now removed from you. You don't get that choice anymore. Um, if you're a fan of an all of the above or competition among resources, this is removing those from the market. So, you know, I, I think this is the exact opposite of, of, of a policy where I think everyone agrees on the policy of this. This really comes down to a, a political uh, decision by one or two companies that is putting a lot of weight around here. Um, and I think that's pretty well documented. I don't think they've hid that at all. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people are stepping up to the support this. I think, fortunately, uh, FERC is, is taking a better view of this. Um, and I think uh, a number of commissioners that are sitting there now hope, oppose this. Uh, and we hope that it, that it goes away and doesn't come back uh, with, a, with an ugly head reared. But I will say, for everyone, if you aren't in a wholesale market and, doesn't think, and don't think this touches you right now, just wait, because I am under no illusion that they will not come back with another policy in a regulated state and say, I'm from South, say you're in South Carolina, this yeah. may not touch you today. It may, it may six months from now. They may say, we don't like, you, you know, your, your nuke uh, facility, you just abandoned that, we're going to protect that. And that's going to, you know, and that's a, that's a case where ratepayers are on the hook for 60 years if they try and bail that out. So yeah. let South Carolina make that decision. Don't let the federal government do it. Well, and I think that was something that was interesting for me to see looking at the comments uh, on, on the, the proposal uh, was that even from RTOs, the folks would need to implement this stuff. There was, there was a lot of pushback because it's a, it's a pretty big... Yeah. The national security risk that's that's being thrown out there that's not that hasn't been demonstrated the reliability or resilience crisis that has been talking about or the polar vortex which is the supposed evidence for this rule uh, competition among technologies kept the lights on during that the lights didn't go out during the yeah. polar vortex because we were able to call upon demand response and wind energy and and nuclear to an extent as well but it it was it was because you could have a grid operator allowing for all technologies to operate in that space yeah. that that kept the lights on and so we can point to the polar vortex but i think that's a that's in support of competitive markets yeah. of all technologies not well, against them and if microsoft's your neighbor and they can flip on their generator right and <laughs> right battery car that, that helps uh devin did you want to add something or yeah I, I i know we'll get back to some retail policy stuff here but just at, at the high level on on the wholesale stuff um you know fundamentally what this what this noper is is it 
defines one attribute that it thinks will can make the grid more reliable or resilient. Keep in mind, we haven't really defined what resilient means yet. Um, but it says, you know, you need to have 90 days of on-site fuel supply. If you meet that criteria, we will provide a subsidy. No matter what you need, we will provide a subsidy to keep you going forward. That violates, that's, that's government dictating one specific approach to reliability and then providing a subsidy for it. The whole premise, going back to decades of wholesale market design, is to ensure incentive compatibility. That is the entire economic premise of these markets, to make sure that the incentives exist uh, to, to provide reliable service in whatever way is possible. And you know, take, take for example Texas, which I mentioned has probably got the most efficient approach to doing that. The only thing that keeps the lights on in Texas are price signals. That's it. They don't mandate any specific approach to do it. They say supply and, you know, our prices are going to reflect supply and demand, and when we get in scarcity conditions, boom, prices get jacked up, and whoever can provide supply is going to be rewarded. And it's going to be signaled to the times and in locations where you need it most. That's the underlying premise of why markets are better, because they don't prescribe activities of what to do. And so this is, this is totally incompatible with the entire construct of wholesale electricity markets. Um, and it, it, it totally encapsulates you know, picking winners. And unfortunately, if we get caught in that mindset of trying to pick winners or losers, or picking a specific technique uh, to promote reliability, uh, then we uh, extremely undermine the functionality of competitive wholesale markets, and you undermine the value of retail choice, ultimately. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Devin. And I, and I think that uh, I've obviously touched on, on an issue that's uh, very uh, time sensitive and, and something that we're, we're all uh, focusing some attention on uh, as this regulatory process uh, moves forward. But I think, Devin, one of the things that you mentioned is, is how prescriptive is the system going to be and how prescriptive is, is government going to be. And it reminds me of a story that was told me by, by a guy who's running for Congress in, in New Hampshire. And this is, a, this is like a live for your die libertarian out there, you know. And, and he's like, yeah, I'm a huge champion of clean energy. Tell, tell me how that is. You know, it's like, what, what are your, your policies going to be? It's just like, listen, I don't want anybody telling me what I can do on my property. And if I want to put on a rooftop solar panel, I don't want to have to deal with a government bureaucracy. I don't want the utility to tell me, no, I can't do it, and I can't sell back my power. For him, it was a personal independence thing. Uh, and it was a, a freedom of choice and, and freedom to do what you want to on, on your property. And I think that that's at uh, a, a very far end of the spectrum, but it, but it touches on... Uh, I think one of the issues that, that we do deal with is that at, at the end of the day, you know, if it's 2% of your income that you're spending on your electricity bill, maybe that's not a lot for some people, but a couple hundred bucks a month is, really is uh, a lot for some people and it, and it matters to them how they're spending uh, that money and, and that choice uh, you know, should, be, should be respected at a very fundamental level. Um, I'd like to invite some questions from our audience uh, you know, here, here in the room. Does anybody have any questions um, on retail? Uh, choice and, and competitive energy markets. This is where you raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought that retail um, uh, choice in terms of supply is a funny thing. I live in Maryland and over the past 10 years I've continually switched between various providers. Um, sometimes it's only a penny less than uh, what Pepco is offering. Sometimes they'll maybe throw in a gift card or, uh, <laughs> or some type of a teaser or a gimmick yeah. to get Free me steak. To, to sign yeah. up. <laughs> maybe a frozen steak. Um, in terms of the business model, what, what is the challenge of getting somebody who's comfortable with their local utility that they've known and used for maybe years or decades to actually take a chance and switch with one of your suppliers, which may not be a household name? Yeah, uh, so I'll take a crack at that. So I, I think there's a couple of challenges that we see, and some are policy driven, and I don't think we have to get into the, the nitty gritty of state politics, but I could talk about that ad nauseum if anyone wants to. But I think from um, an education standpoint, which is what my group does, we see there's a couple of obstacles in consumers' minds to, to shopping. And I think the first is um, there's, a, there's a sense that if you choose, you're putting yourself at risk that if the power goes out or there's an emergency, you're suddenly relying on a company you've never heard of versus relying on Pepco, who's been around for 150 years. And the, the, re the reality is, of course, that the utility is always in charge of maintaining the distribution grid, providing service to all customers. That it, it comes from a misunderstanding about how what the difference is between 
the distribution system versus the supply that travels over. Mm -hmm. So I think educating consumers about that and saying like, you know, you, you know, you're not on a lower priority list if you're not buying your energy supply from Pepco because Pepco, in Maryland, it's a little different, but technically they don't make money off the supply, right? So they have no, they're just passing through the cost of supply. Their money comes from the distribution charges that they, they levy on all consumers. And everyone pays that regardless of who supplies your energy. So when, as we're able to educate consumers to say, you're not, you're not somehow hurting the utility, you're not putting yourself you know, at the bottom of the queue to restore power in an emergency, that this is taking advantage of a distribution system that's a public asset that's been paid for by ratepayers and allowing competition to flourish over that distribution system. So from our perspective, education helps people get over the hump. From a policy perspective, I will say some states are a little bit more, um, have invested a little bit more in building the infrastructure needed to encourage it. So Pennsylvania and Texas have both spent um, significant money in building shopping websites, which give consumers educational tools and also the ability to compare offers. I was on a four hour conference call at the Maryland Public Service Commission yesterday talking about building a similar website in Maryland. They have a very rudimentary one now. But one of the things we're trying to do is, is help give people that kind of confidence that it's okay to shop, here are the tools you need, here's the education you need to make that determination. You know, not every customer is gonna be at that level of confidence right away, but we think the more education and the more sort of sense from a neutral party like the commission that this is an okay thing to do helps. That's a, a, a great question and I think kind of uh, helps get to the point, you know, of w what are you buying when you're, when you're changing, uh, you know, your, your generation source or whatever. Is the electron going to feel as good? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it might be something. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing your, your name and, and who you're with. Sure, uh, Jason Stanick. I'm with the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Gotcha. Thanks, uh, thanks Jason. Uh, any other questions? And if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself first. Go ahead. Um, Jordan from Congressman James Lynn's office from Michigan. So Michigan actually, I'm, I'm very interested in choice. Michigan actually is one of the states that in the wave of choice in the 90s, um, Governor Angler decided to deregulate our entire energy industry. And then um, in 2008, we split back um, because the choice market really wasn't working in Michigan. So I'm curious, what are some lessons you guys learned from Enron and from what happened in the 2000s that are different now? Um, obviously, before we were focused a lot on natural gas uh, as being the choice alternative, but now it's a lot of other choices. So what are some of those things that you guys have learned that are different now? Should I st start off with that sure. one and then turn it over maybe to the retail folks? So yeah, it's, it's been interesting and, and to provide full context for that. So uh, Michigan is one of those hybrid states now that started to restructure and then backtracked to a large extent and right now still has just 10% carve out. So 10% of its customers um, have, have retail choice. Um, the last I heard, and Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, a, a pretty substantial waiting list. Tremendous. Yep. For, for the folks that don't qualify within that 10%. So we're already seeing the, the demand for choice exceed that. We're seeing um, folks currently in that pool where the utility has been trying to, to roll back that 10% as close to zero as possible, where you've had public schools and you've had you know, a lot of businesses saying like, hey, we're benefiting from choice. <laughs> Please keep us in this program. Um, and so you're already seeing like a lot of organic demand for choice uh, in Michigan. Um, at the same time, I think you see a little bit of the Midwest experience now recognizing why Illinois and, and Ohio um, have started to see uh, a lot more advantages for their consumers. Um, so going back to like the 2000s question, um, so yeah, that's, that, that, that issue gets uh, brought up a lot with Enron, California electricity crisis. Um, I had the, the good fortune of, of uh, serving over at FERC with, along with Jason um, in the Office of Enforcement, which was created after Enron. And uh, long story short, there were tons of flaws with the electricity market design in California, everything from not allowing hedging to creating what we call like false arbitrage opportunities. There weren't market monitoring mechanisms in place. Uh, all that's been rectified. There's a reason we haven't had an issue like that since that point in time, right? Here we are coming up on 16, 17 years. Um, and so now we have very active uh, uh, enforcement protocols. Uh, we have very active detection of market manipulation. We have automated uh, mitigation procedures in place um, in each one of these organized markets to correct for any uh, potential uh, uh, 
uh, immediate manipulation, and now there's long uh, major re financial repercussions for doing so uh, that were in existence then. So that's kind of on the wholesale side where that hasn't really been an issue. And then I think a lot of the other trends that we've kind of been hitting on here today um, have, have really brought up why we see this resurgent interest in consumer choice the last 10 years. Uh, anything you guys care to add? I think it's just been interesting in the, in the Nevada context, as Devin mentioned, at the end of 2016, during the, the, the ballot initiative for a constitutional amendment to, to open up uh, the energy sector there, the electricity sector, I think it was approved by something like 71% of the voters. And what happens is that it now goes back in 2018 with the same exact wording, from what I understand, to the, to the voters. And so the, the governor has started this process to understand what's the best way to go about it. And a lot of these, that kind of discussion about the 2000s has come up. And you see um, you know, prominent regulators who were at FERC at the time or who were at Texas at the time and oversaw the Texas deregulation saying, look, if you're going to do it, you, do it you, you need to do all of the things that Devin mentioned and not try and do some kind of hybrid, because that's where you get yourself into to some trouble. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michelle and Devin, and uh, thanks, Jordan, for your question. Uh, any other questions from the room here? Go ahead in the back. My name is Seth. With, I run a nonprofit called The Earth Stewards. I have a question for Michelle. And um, I've recently just learned of a, of a platform, a solution called Watt Time. And I apologize if I'm putting you yeah. on the spot, but I just wanted to plug that and. <laughs> <laughs> no, more, more, more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm plugging just to learn a little it's bit really more exciting. about it. It's really exciting. It's really gets at the heart of this issue. I, I, I didn't know we could plant questions, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Well well he done. must have been at our booth. Really oh. <laughs> so it, it is really exciting, and it, and it really dovetails into this question, question about learned, choice. Lessons learned, lessons learned, learned from yes. So Watt Time is a, an NGO that was started from a bunch of economists, actually, at, um, at Berkeley that was acquired by another NGO, which is kind of weird when one NGO acquires another, but so by Rocky Mountain Institute. And we have partnered with, with them to uh, deploy real-time carbon emissions data about what's happening in your electricity grid, so at the grid level, to the extent that when you click on um, whatever grid it is where you're operating, if it's, if it's Cal ISO, if it's Wash Puget Sound, if it's MISO, wherever it is, New York, uh, you can see in real time uh, and have all of the data of what the, if you were going to have an incremental molecule, incremental demand, if you're gonna flip on the lights, if you were going to plug in an electric vehicle, what plant, what carbon, what the carbon intensity of that electricity would be. And then there's a traffic light to say, well, it's actually going to be more carbon intensive than average if you did it right now. It's going to be less carbon intensive, or it is uh, actual, you know, average for where it is. So you can make for those discretionary decisions. You could decide to optimize. Okay, you know what? It's green. Maybe now's when I should be plugging in my electric vehicle. The idea is down the road, it could be to the extent people wanted it to be, and there was all of the safeguards put in there, automated, so that you could have a a, a grid that could optimize. In, you know, for, for carbon, if you wanted, you could optimize for cost in the same way when you decide the directions you're going to take uh, to get somewhere. Do you want to go the fastest route? Do you want to go the scenic route? Do you want to use mass transit? Do you want to use tolls? You could begin to do that for the electricity grid. So we have that right now for US, uh, all of the US data that's real time. And um, I will send around, we I can send around the, the website that that is available on. And it's also available now for Europe. Uh, last week or two weeks ago, we just uh, released all of the information uh, for Europe. Cool. Thanks for that explanation, uh, Michelle. And, and thanks for the question, Seth. Uh, any other questions in the room here? Go ahead. My name is Patrick from Senator Markey's office. Spring, uh, what does consumer choice, retail choice, mean for consumers who rent or who live in multifamily homes? Good question. Frank, do you want to? Yeah, so you know, it's a great question. So um, I think a lot of it obviously depends on, first and foremost, if, if the uh, consumer is responsible for their utility bill or not. So that you know, depends. You know, I've lived in the DC area for 15 years, and sometimes I was responsible for my utility bill, and sometimes I wasn't. So. Um, so that, from that perspective, a lot of it depends on that. Let's say you take it to another level. Let's say you talk about somebody who is in an apartment or is in a multifamily dwelling and pays their utility bill, is interested in 
clean energy, but say can't do rooftop solar because they don't have the authority to do that. We're seeing some innovative solutions come out to help those kinds of customers. Um, one of them is, you may have heard of it, it's called community solar, which is effectively you, um, in states where it's allowed, you can um, have a solar facility built and um, consumers or subscribers um, basically agree to, to purchase a certain amount of the energy and the renewable credits that come off of that. It can be organized differently. Sometimes you get the energy without the credits, sometimes you get both. Um, but it allows you to effectively almost like share a behind the meter solar facility um, among different consumers. So hmm. there's solutions there for people who want to participate in something like rooftop solar but can't because they're in multifamily dwelling or something like that. Um, so there's, you know, I think we're already seeing some kind of market solutions for those exact reasons. You know, as long as somebody can control their utility bill, they should have the same choices that somebody who owns their own property does. And we face this also in the data center space. I mean, some of the data centers are owned and some of them are leased and they're colo. Mm -hmm. And so how do you deal with the, the companies that are, are running those, those data centers to make sure that they either have access to this or that they're able to, to purchase the kind of renewable or, you know, the kind of energy you want at the cost you want it. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thanks for that question. Any other questions in the room? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Alex Kraut. I'm with Energetics Incorporated. Thanks, um, Alex. And my question is, how far out are we from the point where it's a realistic possibility for households to have rooftop solar and uh, enough storage that <laughs> they don't even need to do it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I uh, closer than most people think. <laughs> I, I, quite honestly, I, I think there's this. You know, I think we we kind of internally have a question of how quickly can this technology go on the grid? Oh, it's it. No, we can't get to this where it's ten years from now. But I mean, if you look at it, ten years ago, we would have never thought we would have had this amount of renewables on the grid and this far with energy storage and this far with demand response and all this. So. The idea that this technology is so far off is wrong. Um, the question there becomes, how do you make sure that you just don't have everyone just islanding off? Because yeah. there are benefits of having that, that grid. And I think that's where yeah. a lot of sophisticated customers are making sure they're just not pulling out. And the Defense that. Department. I mean, right. You see that them taking the same type of model. Right. Well. Yeah. So I, I think there's been some some offices trying to be forward looking on that to make sure that we aren't getting to that point um, where you just kind of have a, a real grid crisis on that point. But but to, your, to the specific question of how far off, much closer than you think and the market moves yeah. very fast, so. And on storage, I would just say yeah. we're about halfway through, um, you know, a research initiative with the University of Texas. We are doing some uh, testing right now, one of our data centers in Virginia to understand like how, how instead of using a, the battery, what if you actually did storage? And, that, mm -hmm. and so I would say a 2.0 to this panel, we're talking about choice. Choice yeah. just isn't about taking electrons. Choice is about the ability to, to right. be two-way. And that's a really exciting proposition yeah. for companies. It's a really exciting proposition for individuals, for, for, for households. Yeah, and that really gets into that broader question of kind of the, however you want to say, grid 2.0, 21st century electricity system. We really dive, dive into this as an organization on a, on a number of fronts. That's a much broader conversation. But essentially, for years, we had one power plant lines that flew one way. Now it's much more decentralized. You have consumers that are giving grid back. You have advanced meters that can collect data much more in a much more sophisticated way. And it's, it's a dynamic grid as opposed to much more just one way power flow. So I think that creates a lot of challenges, but also efficiencies. So, you know, we, yeah. a lot of states are, and commissions are wrestling with this issue now, so. Yeah, the value, the value for choice in this distributed world paradigm is, is so pronounced. Yeah. Because you start getting in this, you know, probably the most, uh, the most common fight that you see in PUCs across the country right now are distributed generation type right. designs, right? Demand yeah. charges, yeah. fixed charges, everyone's arguing over the structure, and even when you get the structure settled, they're, they're disagreeing on what the, the administrative determination is of these demand charges and things like that. Um, when you do that through a central plan process, it's not going to send the right price signals to deploy existing resources, and it sure as heck not going to send the right signals to, uh, to, to signal technologists to develop the next generation of technologies, because you can't determine uh, the value of a market product very well 
when it's entirely determined by an administrative construct. And so as we go forward, and we see it already with some of these alternative suppliers, they're already tailoring a lot of their offerings uh, based on the unique demand profile, but also these prosumers, right, the producers and consumers, they're tailoring their products based to the unique circumstances uh, of, of those individuals, uh, families, and, and businesses. And so the value of that long term is, is very large. Yeah. That's, uh, I think those are all important uh, comments and, and, a, and a great question. So we can't ask for the home independence kit this year for Christmas. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it does seem to me that particularly with, with energy storage as part of, part, of the prob the part of the equation that needs to be solved, that we're seeing you know, a doubling in, in capacity uh, kind of at that same curve that, that microprocessors were on not that long ago. We remember that they, you know, relatively the same cost and, and doubling in power uh, almost every year. And I think that that's a pretty impressive uh, thing that we're seeing, so, so not that far off at all. <coughs> Any other questions uh, here in the room? Go ahead in the back. Yeah, that's Wyatt Lewis from the Energy and Commerce Committee. So, I mean, looking at all of these uh, future options for competition and technology, I assume this is going to disrupt the business model for host utilities. So what advice would you have for host utilities? How do they need to adapt to stay profitable or kind of stay up with the new innovation and technology that's coming about? Yeah, well, I think we've seen some of those battles uh, on, on the front lines already. Um, I don't know if yeah. Frank, you want to no, take the first cut or, or Dylan? Go for it. Yeah, sure. I think uh, every state is wrestling with that right now. Um, and I think we as an organization are trying to make sure that everyone is at the table having those things. So we are very active with a variety of different uh, PUCs across the country and trying to make regional approaches um, where you can get commissioners, utilities, energy developers and, and everything together to talk about how that transition is moving. Um, and I think, you know, I think some, some groups may just take the, you know, everybody defect and, and that's the way to go. And I think that's, AWE doesn't take that position. And uh, we think you need to have a proactive relationship with that to make sure this is moving forward in a way where everyone benefits. The grid stays reliable, it's affordable, and you have everyone participating in a much more dynamic system. Mm -hmm. So it's, that, that is a non-complicated way of saying it. Uh, they're, they're really, really challenging questions, but I think we're trying to make sure that that conversation is moving forward for grid modernization. Yeah. And th these are hard conversations. And, yeah. and, and our approach has been, look, we, we have these utilities that we've worked with for a long time, want to continue to work with them. We all just need to think outside the box to make sure um, we are all having our needs addressed. And so these, these conversations for Wyoming, for Washington, these are multi-year conversations. Right. And you do want to hit your head against the wall a lot of times when you're having them. <laughs> but, it, you know, and I think that that's what's been, um, been, you know, interesting and to see which utilities have kind of, kind of you know, Black Hills, which is, uh, you know, the Wyoming-based utility is probably not what folks would have think, of, think about coming up first about this innovative solution. But they were, you know, really game to figure out how do we think think differently about this. And I would just add, you know, um, utilities, um, obviously the, the regulated utility um, as, a, as a single entity, you know, they're facing challenges. But if you look at the parent company, so say um, one of our members is, is WGL Energy Services, which is a, a sister related company to the, the gas utility in uh, Washington Gas uh, Utility here in the DC area. Well, WGL Energy Services it does electricity and solar stuff related activities in you know several dozen states so the utilities themselves the utility holding companies are also making the decision to say hey look you know not as a regulated affiliate or regulated utility but as a you know competitive company operating in the marketplace under the same level playing field and that's a separate discussion to make sure affiliates are really on a level playing field but there's opportunities there too I mean you think of a company like Exelon which has you know, utilities across the country, they also have very large competitive suppliers that are part of their portfolio. So um, I think the utilities also, um, forward-leaning utilities also recognize that, you know, they have to evolve and change and can become, um, you know, participate as a market a participant in, in this new kind of new brave new world. <laughs> right, right. Gotcha. Uh, let's take one more question. If there's one, one last hand, or if there's not, that's fine too. Um, I, I do want to thank you all for uh, coming here today and taking uh, serious time to dive into an, an interesting issue. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, really it. The, the Enron case was, was brought up and 
uh, a lot has changed and a lot of learning has been done in a lot of different states and I think that that's part of the challenge uh, that we see when having this conversation that there's, there is a lot of variation between all of the different states uh, and probably some good models that, that we can be learning from. Uh, but I think that what's clear is that the value proposition is there and whether it's from a personal, personal choice standpoint that you want to buy what you want to buy because it's your own personal business, that's fine. Uh, if it's an environmental uh, thing and there are, there are social benefits that we're concerned about, that's good. Uh, if it's just value, uh, I think the interesting thing here is that, that when you look at the different emerging technologies and how uh, you know, even wind production has changed over the last five years and, and is more cost competitive than, than ever before, that matters in terms of, of the new technologies that are on the table that can solve uh, real problems that, that folks are facing. Uh, and really creates new opportunities for, uh, for diversification, uh, for distributed generation, uh, and for, for folks to be able to get, get power the way that they want to uh, at home. Uh, let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists. Thank you very much.